I want to point to us one more passage for today's reading. And uh, this comes from Acts chapter 21. 21 verse 1 through verse 16. If you have a phone, you could search it up. If you don't, um, you know, paper Bible. Or uh, if you can see the screen up here, uh, we'll also read it from here. The passage we're about to read details some of Paul's travels as he's uh, preparing to return to Jerusalem. Uh, It it tends to be a boring section of scripture for a lot of us. So I would invite you, uh, give your full attention, uh, focus and meditate upon what God speaks to us through Acts 21. And let's, let's give this to the word of the Lord. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come inside of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on to board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and when we entered, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Join me in just a short time of prayer and let's ask the Lord to to meet our needs, also to speak to us through scriptures. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, for Lord, it's ever rich and sharp to pierce us. God, it's always useful to teach us something new, but even more importantly, to reveal some new glory about you, some new beauty of what you have done. God, some great hope in what we can look forward to in the future. Lord, your word is always effective. God, we realize that when we close ourselves to the word that sometimes it's effective in judgment proving that we're hard-hearted and that we're unwilling to listen so father we come with uh we hope proper respect and sobriety god with a proper sense of fear before you lord not that you would punish us but that lord you are to be taken seriously god because you are important lord as we do come before the word clear from our hearts and our minds all the distractions god all those things that would uh, pull our eyes away from you and God from your your scriptures today and Lord whatever those things may be we trust them to your care and God uh, you know us to be frail creatures who are Lord uh, small and oftentimes out of control of the main important things of their life we recognize this and we come before you Lord humble God uh, be our God Lord uh, not only powerful and wise and orchestrating all things to your glory but also compassionate lord also loving looking into the little things that we stress so much over lord even those take care of them and reveal yourself to be the author of our good fortunes 
And Father, where we see something else turn, uh, Lord, let us trust you and give us strength, comfort and console us, and always lead us to the face of Jesus Christ. Father, for we know that in him, God, uh, your church and your individual saints, wherever they are, will never be disappointed. So God, reveal to us here how important and how good friendships in the church can be, Lord, when we seek your face in them. And God, we ask that you would do this in the preaching and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at what uh, is in some ways kind of a part two to the nature of Christian relationships and Christian community we saw last week in chapter 20. Uh, this is not my choice. Uh, in Paul's travels, uh, all throughout his travels are dotted these relationships that are manifested and forming and, uh, and are really kind of the center of, of Paul's journey for this time. So I think Luke wants us, the author here, wants us to look at his relationships as kind of a model for what our relationships should look like, what they could be, and what we should aspire to as a church and congregation. Uh, I mentioned before, a lot of churches overly focus on the relationships so they lose their mission, right? They lose the sense of, of call to the, to the outside world, to their neighbors. And if, if you think about where does the gospel send us, it certainly sends us out of solitude and loneliness. It sends us out of ourselves. And I think it sends us in three directions. And the three directions are kind of the, the main, I, I guess, ministry departments of our church. It sends us into the heart of God. It sends us into his, his life, his personality, his character, his work. It, it should, if, if the gospel is actually working in you, it should make you a deep student of God and his goodness, of his glory. But it also sends you out into the world. And I think that's something that we've probably lacked quite a bit in the last couple of years, right? It sends us out into the lost. It sends us out into the broken, to the suffering. It sends us out to sometimes our opponents, right into their faces with the gospel. And that's also what we see as normative for the church. They're out there. And they're out there with people who are not of the same religious belief and are sometimes quite hostile to the church as well. But the thing we see in these latter parts of, of the chapters of Acts is it sends us into one another. It sends us into messy Christian relationships. And I realize messy is such a popular kind of, you know, millennial, post-millennial kind of, you know, word. You know, it's like, ooh, these relationships are messy and I'm a messy person. Expect messiness, right? It's, it's one of those buzzy, fun words, but it really is that way because you look at the way that the relationships work, they're not pristine. Uh, they're oftentimes filled with disagreements, sometimes disagreements for the same mission. Uh, they're filled with, as Paul describes here, heartbreak, that even though they see some of the same spirit-revealed truth about the world, there's disagreement about how to pursue God's calling, and, and there's heartbreak as relationships are torn apart. Uh, there's grief and sorrow. And so the messy relationships are still life-giving to an extent that I think you are not going to find out in the world in the same kind of way. Uh, Christian relationships are that important. What I want to point out in, um, in this passage, this string of, of events, string of travels, uh, is you see here the gracious nature of friendship. They're provided for us free of charge. And that's a, that's a wondrous gift. You see the painful cost of friendship, which we talked about a bit last week, but um, we see ag again here described in Paul's interaction with some of these disciples. And then finally, the necessity of friendships, uh, that friendships are absolutely needed. If you're a Christian who thinks that you can kind of get by without friends, without Christian friends inside the church, spurring you on, helping you, challenging you, making your life miserable, blessing you, doing all those things that friends do, uh, not only will you miss out on the comfort of life, you are actually not going to do the mission that God gives you in your life. You will be futile, effete, helpless. You need friends. And I think I, I can point this out from the scriptures. Uh, but follow here. What is going on and, and how am I getting these ideas? Um, the travelogue is basically Paul getting on his way back to Jerusalem. And if you remember back in chapter 20, we talked about this a week ago, uh, Jerusalem is going to be the beginning of all of Paul's misery and suffering for the rest of his life. It's going to be where he gets in prison. It's going to be where he gets beaten. People hate him. And city to city to city he goes. It's going to basically be in chains. It's going to be with people hating him and, and, and turning against him, possibly extended family members calling for his death. So he goes to Kos. It's a small island south of Miletus where he met those elders. He goes to Rhodes, right? It's a larger island. 
to the southeast, Patara. He goes to the southern tip of Asian, Asia Minor. He transfers to another ship heading to Phoenicia on the Palestinian coast. So if you've ever played a video game like uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, you know, where it's like beautiful blue waters and it's like you're rolling around with a spear and a loincloth. This is like what it looks like, a ship, right, with people rowing oars and setting up sails. And it's like this sunlit journey on his way to imprisonment and eventually death. So it looks like, like, a, like a Bora Bora cruise or something on your way to the gulag, right? And, and this is Paul's life for a while. But with him is this cohort of disciples. And this includes Luke. At some point, Luke was picked up here, and, and this is the guy who wrote this book, right? And so he's got buddies with him. But this is a very interesting thing. This is particularly portrayed to be Paul's mission. The companions are there to support Paul in the suffering he's about to go through. Now, I know for a lot of us, it doesn't feel like, well, that's not a team sport. That's like, that's just Paul doing his thing, right? But it, it, they're not shy to say that. In fact, Luke is not shy to say, yeah, we're there to support him because he was the one who's going to get sent out eventually to Rome, eventually to all over the world with his gospel as a prisoner. And I think that's important for the pastor because what it's being presented as here is not just ministry as a team, which the Bible does teach us to think about, but in many ways it describes even in the solitary nature of having to go to prison by yourself and suffer alone. That even on the way there, he needed companions, and the companions helped. That friendship helps sometimes the most lonely ministry tasks that you have to do. He had companions with him. He lands at Tyre, and there they simply look for Christians. I mean, I don't know if, how they Google back in those days. Maybe they just start asking the marketplace, you know any Christians? You know any people who talk about Jesus Christ? And eventually they find their way. Yeah, I think this guy who owns a shop down there, he talks about Jesus sometimes, and, you know, go see that guy, right? And they find the disciples. They find them, and they stay there seven days. It takes probably that long to unload the ship's cargo, to load it back on. Maybe they're looking for another ship while this is all happening. And eventually they make their way back to Caesarea, right? Caesarea is a big, huge port city built by Herod. And there, here comes back, like, you know, in any good narrative, there's like a flashback to an earlier character, Philip the Evangelist, right? Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven table servers, you know, when, when the widows needed their, their food distributed. Uh, Philip the Evangelist, who uh, went out preaching publicly, right? Um, I mean, this is the Philip. Now, here's another interesting, th interesting thing. You would think Philip just became this, like, almost like wandering samurai, right? Like just going through the land, evangelizing, ministering, being sucked up by wind and, you know, like crazy life, right? He settled in Caesarea for like 20 years. He built a home. He had four daughters, right? So th this is not the kind of guy who looks like some adventurous, just like itinerant man. This guy eventually settled down and still, I'm sure of it, Philip the evangelist was locally in his own life and, and community doing evangelism sharing the faith, inviting people to church, introducing them to the disciples. And I think that's a good balance to us when we get a little bit too romantic a picture of what missions and evangelism could be. It's cross-country, it's, it's overseas, it's another language, another people. That Philip the evangelist did it however God let him. And here he was four unmarried daughters. I sometimes almost wonder, like, is, is it Luke throwing shade or is that kind of like a qualification for the prophecy? We don't know, but we just know that they were unmarried uh, and they prophesied. But Paul and the company stayed with them for a little while. And you can almost imagine in your head the, the discussion Philip had with Paul. All the things in the first part of Acts that Philip saw, the stoning of Stephen, the persecution that sent out the gospel to Samaria in these places, and Paul and everything that happened in this, the middle part of Acts, and them just discussing that at their house for like seven days, drinking wine, eating food, right, doing all this stuff, just talking about how the gospel's been working. It must have been lively. And then you see shortly after this, this intertext where like Agabus, this prophet who probably just like in Acts 11.27 when these prophets came from Jerusalem uh, down, that this prophet basically tells Paul, look, the Holy Spirit told me 
when you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound up. You're going to be imprisoned. Probably this long sash that he just wraps himself up in and binds himself up in his legs and says, this is what you are going to look like when you get to Jerusalem. Whoever owns this sash is going to be tied up like this. And then I think it really hit the cohort. It hit his buddies. Paul, you're going you're gonna to go to jail, and this is not going to end well. And I, I'm guessing that somewhere in their mind they remembered it didn't end well for Jesus. That was a, a needed, miraculous grace of God, but it was the heartbreak of all of the lives of the disciples. We don't want to see that this happen to you. We know what happens to people in Jerusalem when they come like this. You're going to be bound. Please, please stay. Don't go on. And as Paul says, you're breaking my heart, what, what he's describing to them is, it's like you're trying to weaken my resolve to do this thing that I need to do. And if you remember back in chapter 20, Paul actually said that he was compelled by the Spirit to go. That it was a Spirit that was the one that was encouraging him, basically telling him, you need to go do this, and this is what's going to happen. Before we kind of get to like, so what does all this mean, right? I told you there's a few points here. What is the big picture that Luke is painting? If you never saw this in the book of Acts, Paul's journey to Jerusalem is, is what Luke is doing is he's trying to comp- make a parallel comparison to Jesus' ju- journey to Jerusalem. You remember back when Jesus was like in Galilee and he could have just left, right? He could have just not ever gone to the cross. He could have just escaped all the rejection and punishment crosses, whips, thorns, all of it. He could have just gone the other way. He had the opportunity. He had it to the very last minute. But the gospel writers always describe this this long story narrative about Jesus Christ going to Jerusalem, going to the center of God's people, going to the center of corruption and, and wickedness, going to the centers of power and laying down his power, laying down his life to save. And he would do it because God commanded him to humble himself and to do the work of salvation for all his people. It was a, in many ways, like like a self-deconstructing act of submission to the Father's will. Even down to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's on his knees praying that the cup would be taken from him, but your will be done. It's like he's being pressed down to nothing. He would be exhausted of his life on that cross. Luke is painting the picture that now the ministry of the cross, the the message of the cross, has a similar kind of pathway, at least for Paul and his mission. It's a travel back now, not to triumph into great congregations and people and praises and, and itinerant ministries, but a travel to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, which looks like a closing up of his ministry platform, right? Prison is not a great place to gather crowds and preach to thousands of people and gain converts. It's not a great place to flex your intellectual thoughts and and writings and thinkings through theologies and doing all the things that academics do. It's not a great place to get books. It's not a great place to learn and, and exchange ideas. It's the place where everything that he was kind of being built to do is now collapsing to become sit there and pray. Evangelize that guard that walks in and is there from three to seven. Talk to some of the prisoners and teach them how to sing songs. It's a really humbling change of life in ministry. He's going to write some letters. He's going he's gonna to do ministry in this fashion from the future. And he's not going to have control any longer. And it's going to be suffering all the way through. Uh, this is God's will. And it's noteworthy that in chapter 20, Paul says that God not only told me what I must do, but what's going to happen when I do it. That's very much like Jesus. Garden of Gethsemane. He showed me the horrors of the cross and then called me to do it. And that's ministry. The reason why the sermon here is focusing on friendship uh, is because I think what Luke is pointing out is on Paul's journey to in some sense his cross moment, his, at least his pilot moment, right? His time before the pilots of the world. That Paul's ministry was supported always and constantly by Christian disciples. 
That seems to be what it is. He's showing how now the Holy Spirit is filling disciples throughout many different cities, and especially Paul's companions, to lift up Paul on his way to Jerusalem and suffering and ministry and evangelism. And didn't you see it in Miletus, all the time taken to describe how the Ephesian elders prayed with Paul, pleaded with Paul, felt sorrowful for, for Paul? Why describe emotions when you're describing like narrative events? It's because the emotions matter in describing, well, these relationships are part of the story and they're, they're part of what matters here. The Christian church is not a threat to the empire. Look at them. They're not some revolutionaries that are trying to overthrow things. They're friends before they're political or before they have some message to the world, they love one another. That's part of Luke's defense to, to all the Roman world. Look at what the church is. Is this really a threat to you guys? These people care for one another. That's part of what they are. That's part of what Jesus has been doing amongst them. And when he shows Paul being supported from city to city, again, remember, Luke's likely writing this in some ways as a defense to the Roman Empire that the, the Christian church is not a threat to the peace of the nation. What he's doing is he's showing, well, look at how they treat one another. Do you fear this? Now, what did you see? Every city that he went in, as soon as he found disciples, he found a home. Now, hospitality might have been a, a common virtue that they held up in those ancient times, but this is something far more. When I said, you know, the first point here, the grace of friendship, here's what I mean by that. Uh, they're provided for you free of charge. Uh, there is something uniquely gracious of God to just give Paul not just a place to stay wherever he was, as long as there are Christians there, but to give him disciples to be loved with, to, to love with, to, to talk with, to have a relationship with. Because did you notice this? When he stays at Tyre, he's there uh, for like, what, a day? The next, he goes to Caesarea, he's there, and, you know, it says uh, many days. We don't know how long that is, right? So it could be a number of days. But they felt pretty quick the confidence to confront Paul about his journey plans and say, you need to not go to Jerusalem. And they're not just saying that because, what? It's a threat. They're going to come back. They're going to find us out. It's not selfishly motivated. It's because they cared for Paul. We don't want you to go there and suffer. In the same kind of way, you see people who are also filled with the Holy Spirit, Agabus, this prophet, saying, coming out to Paul, don't go. Don't go down there. You see earlier in chapter 20 that these elders and, and the disciples or I'm sorry, not 20, 21, verse 4, they plead with Paul through the Spirit not to go on to Jerusalem. Now, if you're a careful reader here, you should start getting this question. Paul was told by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Now, Luke is saying, the narrator is saying, that through the Holy Spirit, these guys are telling him not to go to Jerusalem. Well, what's going on here? Is the Holy Spirit like saying different things through different people? That's a very different message. Why, why is that? What explains that? Well, I think the answer is pretty simple. Uh, for Agabus and for these disciples, what was made clear to them through the Holy Spirit was what was going to happen. It was clear to all the disciples that had the Holy Spirit reveal this to them that Paul would be imprisoned. Now, what was not clear, and this is made clear also later in the, pa the passage here, what was not clear is what does God want? What does God want you to do? That was not as clear, and here's why you know. Because at the end of the passage, verse 14, and since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. Now, that's not just like saying like Christians like, oh, <laughs> will of the Lord then, do whatever you're going to do, right? They're not just throwing up their hands and saying like, well, whatever. This is actually them saying, whatever the Lord wills then, God, do that and, and follow that. Do you see the kind of the, the challenge here? Oftentimes, Christians have the same sense of discernment about maybe what will be, right? Or the same data and the same facts. But what's not clear a lot of times is what should you be doing? This is often not clear despite the fact that Christians can agree on many things, right? Should we get 
red carpet or blue carpet, right? If you don't know, that splits churches sometimes because there's so much drama and disagreement and resentment inside churches that that can just tear churches apart. Um, I think a church can agree. We want a good pastor, a godly man, a person who's going to love us, care for us, be responsible, know the scriptures. And that you see two guys, and it's like, this guy's 65 and old, and he looks like he's got a lot of experience. This guy's young, and he wears ripped jeans, and he's really funny, and this, you know, and <laughs> this guy's neither. But, like, I see two different sort of paragons of what church pastoring could be. And you'll find, well, we have some of the same principles, but we're in disagreement. And the same happened with Paul and Silas, right? John Mark, thumbs up or thumbs down on this trip. Paul's like, thumbs down. The guy failed, right? He's, Paul's like, we can't risk this on like another project of yours. Barnabas is like, dude, give him another shot. I gave you a shot, right? And you turned out pretty good. Why don't we let this guy go with us? And they had such a disagreement, they split. Same Holy Spirit in both of them, likely showing them both truth, the redeemability of a guy like John Mark. And he did. He was one of the companions later in Paul's life. So Barnabas was kind of right in some ways. And also the importance of the mission. Both. But not always clarity as to then what do we do about this guy? We don't know. And so what's the conflict here? Only Paul really had the particular specific urging of the Holy Spirit to go because he was the one called. Everybody else knew what would happen. And so there was what, a disagreement here about whether he should go or not. What does that teach us? There's a real relationship here. If you have a guest preacher stay with you for a few weeks, do you really feel like you could be giving them like advice about whether they should have a divorce or not or advice about whether they should be a lifelong missionary or not and tell them you need to not go? See, it takes a certain kind of freedom of relationship to be able to do that. And what's noteworthy here is what commentators note Paul didn't plant a bunch of these churches. He arrives at them as complete strangers, and they receive him. Why is that? Merely because of Jesus Christ and his gospel. Let me stop and just say for us, you know what one of the best benefits of being a Christian is? And and it gets exploited, and it gets abused oftentimes, but the best benefit. If you really love Jesus, you can go anywhere in the world where the gospel is preached, and you will find family. found that here in Buffalo. It didn't take long. Now, it it took long to build it up because it's like a plant, right? You got to water it. You got to feed it. You got to make sure it gets sunlight. You got to take care of it. You got to make sure it doesn't die because you're toxic, right? You got to do all this stuff to make sure it's alive. But we knew there are churches in Buffalo. And so if we ever get desperate, I may never find friends to play Magic the Gathering with. I may never have friends to go play Airsoft with, right? All those things are just hobbies but I will have family. I just got to look. And literally, how easy is it today? Google, gospel, church, buffalo. And there's a really good chance you're going to find a Christian, and they're going to lead you to other Christians. I realize, like, for us in the United States, this has become like, yeah, of course. Of course that's the case. And in fact, if that's not the case, what a bum city, and what a bad church, and, and how horrible is this, right? Like, of course, there's a church. And sometimes you're moving to other areas of the world and you think, well, there should be a church there, right? Don't take that for granted. It is not that way without Jesus. You kind of are rolling the dice that you can align enough things that you're interested in to find real good friends. But in Christ, let me say this. If there are some Christians who really love Jesus, you'll become quick close to them because you don't have to talk about sports or you don't have to talk about hobbies or things that you ate or other stuff to try to figure out if you actually have things in common you can literally just jump straight to jesus and and be awkward be that guy but say you love jesus i'm pretty into him i love to talk about him and read things about him have you read any books about him lately i've been reading gentle and lowly by dane orland it's a great book have you read that you just find your way in and it's not just the latest music that you happen to like It's not just the culture around it or the words. It's literally Jesus. Say his name. You'll find people that you will perhaps have lifelong friendships with just because of that.
It's a grace of God, and it's found. Now, again, hear me well. Hat tip Tim Keller here for his point on this. You have to maintain them. You have to cultivate them. Uh, You can't simply go to church for friends. You literally need to go to church for Jesus, and you'll find like people. But it's given by God, and, and you need to take advantage of it. Woe to those Christians who, for whatever selfish or, or sometimes injured reasons, don't connect with other Christians and seek to do their Christianity alone. It's a misery. Christian fellowship's a misery, too, a lot of times, too. So that's real, too. But it's even more miserable alone because it's a sick wasting away of life, and, and it's not worth it. Uh, so there's the pain, uh, and that's what Paul sees, too. When they argue with him, it's like breaking his heart. It's weakening his resolve. He knows what he has to do, but they're, they're the pressure on him. Could you just imagine there, there's, and again, there's, there's n- nothing, uh, nothing discriminatory, but in those days, when you're a Philip the Evangelist type of guy and you got four unmarried daughters, that's a lot of housework getting done, <laughs> right? Because they're not married off and, and distributing their work elsewhere. In those days, that means food would always be prepared. Things would always be taken care of. You'd always have a, a wondrous place to live, right? No kids running around, so a lot of freedoms. He could have just stayed at Philip the Evangelist's house and just shot, you know, what, the, I only know the bad word version of that, uh, shoot the uh, wind or whatever. They just talk and hang out and, and think about theology and, and do ministry, build it up in Caesarea, but he doesn't. He feels the pull out. He suffers to be with them. He leaves. And if you don't think that's enough, remember that in elsewhere in Paul's letters, he describes like, how, what does my suffering look like? You know what one of his sufferings is? Every day thinking about other Christians all over the world. That's suffering and that's baggage. And we need that. Now finally, finally here, uh, the power of friendships or the necessity of friendships. Uh, I mentioned before, what was Paul doing? Uh, John Stott mentions of this passage that what fortified Paul on what was being presented to him as his own road to crucifixion was friendship dotted along this journey. I don't know if he wrote that. I, I basically summarized that from his writings, but Paul had to see that in Jerusalem would be the greatest trials of his life. And he kept on taking time to meet with and be encouraged by and strengthened by these Christian disciples. And what's really noteworthy here, he doesn't, it doesn't describe him teaching and just doing ministry to them. He just gets them. It's probably just dinners. It's hanging out and walking through marketplaces. It's meeting their family. And, and whenever he goes to the ship, it's like wives and children following along too. Kids praying for Paul him feeling that as he leaves and as the ship sails away, could you imagine looking at the shore at the people standing there? And yet, Luke is presenting this as in many ways the fuel of God, of Paul's courage to go to Jerusalem. Kept going, nonstop, city by city, until at the end of the passage he arrives. Some of the disciples at Caesarea went with us, so some said, you know what? And you know what? I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to come with you then, Paul. Let me pack up real quick, and I'll get on that ship with you. It's insanity. And they stay at the house of Mason of Cyprus, an early disciple, and they all stayed there together. And again, Jerusalem church welcomed them warmly. They received the brothers gladly. That's a noteworthy thing because Paul, the guy who's persecuting, the guy, again, who was probably not the most popular one, you know, amongst the, the normal Christians there received. In short time, the crowds are going to start calling for Paul away with him, his kinsmen, his countrymen, his people. But I think the friends that he had both dotted along the landscape that he made and also the ones particularly there that are with him in Jerusalem are going to continue to be the ones that give him any kind of comfort when God pushes him to the limits of ministry. Paul basically describes that, you know, later on when it's like he's really in the dumps, people just visiting with a letter, with a coat, 
having a companion with him was one of the great blessings. He thanked him profusely for guys like Eutych, not Eutychus, uh, uh, who's that guy that sent him, I think from Philippi or something. But when he was abandoned later in life, which again, also reality of Christian relationships, one of the greatest pains is because the friendships are the things that really propped him up. Let me give you, I, I guess, a, a point of application and advice. You need these friendships. They're a grace of God that are available to you. Wherever you go that the gospel is preached and converts are made, you have this blessing available. They're not perfect, and they're going to be painful, and a lot of times they're going to betray you as well. So be, realize that this is all part of the cocktail of suffering and blessing of, of life here on earth. But how do you make them? How do you form them? The, the simplest thing I can say about making friends if you feel like, I don't think I have enough, well, here's how you do it. Uh, you got to find a common interest, and it can't be yourself, and it can't be the other person. <laughs> That's pretty much the, the big rule. It can't be my biggest interest is me and my feelings and my needs. You want to you be my friend? Because as much as you can maybe find some sympathetic people, it doesn't last, and, and they'll get exhausted. Um, every true friendship is going to be based about based around something that both of you value even more than the friendship itself, right? Uh, and in the case of Christian friendships, that is Jesus. Now, let me tell you, inside of a church, you can probably find a bunch of friends that just have similar interests that are lower grade, right? I enjoy whiskey. You want to drink some whiskey? Buy a bottle, and I'll have you over my house, right? We will, we will hang out, and it, it could have nothing to do with Jesus. It could just be, ooh, that's nice, Where'd you get this, right? Because that's a low-level affinity, but I enjoy that. In fact, there's a possibility I might enjoy that more than your company, right? But the shared interest can bring us together, right? That's how friendships tend to work. You go to, you go to a work softball game or whatever, and it's just like, I happen to like softball, and I found the only other guy that does like softball too. So we kind of connected, and we got together. We built a friendship around that. One of the most awkward things that your spouse will ever do is sit you down in a room with another guy and be like, you like football, right? He likes football too. Like, <laughs> we'll just leave you guys alone, right? And then you got to just kind of get out there and say, so you like the bills? <laughs> it's like, and you're trying to see, like, do our interests match enough like, to actually form a friendship here? And, you're, and sometimes you don't know. Sometimes all you got is you look like me, shared life background, there has to be a way for you inside the church to find, I think Jesus is the biggest thing in my life, and I'm actually interested in him, to learn about him, to think about him, to sing about him, to, to build art around him, and to find the other people in church, and maybe this is the thing, that have some similar ways in which they love Jesus that you can share. You find other people that like singing, find them, join with them sing with them. You find some people that are really intellectual, that love reading and, and parsing out ideas about Jesus and about the gospel and about Christianity. Find those brainiacs and talk with them. Build those relationships. Do you like people that just like doing? And it's like, I, I need to serve people. I need to get people connected. I need to do things for the Lord. Then you got to find those people. And I realize sometimes in a church like ours, size like ours, you don't get to have a huge pool of people to do that with. Sometimes like you're close enough, I guess. <laughs> You're near enough that I guess you can be my friend. And the one thing I've learned over time in church, uh, if you are desperate enough, you'll get friends. It might look really pathetic, actually, for a lot of us, right? Because sometimes it gets so pathetic, it's like, will you be my friend? Because I have no friends in this church, and I would like some friends. Will you be my friend? And maybe some will say, I'm actually full. I'm too busy. Let me introduce you to this guy. This guy will be your friend, right? Uh, I've actually done other church members, and they've formed relationships. Uh, it's not about pride. It's not about can I keep my dignity while I do it. It's literally, I guess I need you, don't I? So how do I do that? Who cares if it's awkward? It could literally be, say it. I'm pretty lonely most of the time. Do you think you have some time to meet up just to get together and, you know, and maybe this, not just talk about me, right, but to discuss faith in Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And if they're into Jesus, I think they'll probably say, yeah, I think I, I could do that. If you say, let's come together and talk about, you know, my lack of friendship, they might say, 
all right, for a while. But until you find something that is bigger than you to love together, then you're not going to let those friendships take off. Let me, uh, let me read you a quote. I love C.S. Lewis on this. I, in fact, I have like four quotes, but I'm only going to read you like one. Friendship arises out of mere companionship when two or more of the companions discover that they have in common some, in, some insight or interest or even taste which the others do not share and which, till that moment, each believed to be his own unique treasure or burden. The typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what, you two? I thought I was the only one. It's when two such persons discover one another, when whether with immense difficulties and semi-articulate fumblings or with what would seem to us amazing and elliptical speed, they share their vision. It is then that friendship is born, and instantly they stand together in an immense solitude. And he actually goes on in that same book to describe how Jesus, as this incredible master of ceremonies, for his own glory and mission, actually puts people like that together. Now, it takes work, and maybe you haven't found them yet, but they're there. And maybe you got to grind some rough edges off. Maybe you got to learn a new hobby. I don't like golf. I'm thinking about learning golf just to be friends with some people here that like golf more because I realize I can change my interests, actually, but I can't always change who's here. And that's, that's not a buff on me. I mean, you could also learn to play Warhammer, right, guys? So that's cool, too. But you'll never lack real friends when you love Jesus Christ. And think about Jesus, because Jesus, he came to earth with us. Dude, how much of a bum deal is that? Like, I got to figure out how to become friends with these guys. They like fishing. They don't have hobbies. They're like not even educated. What do I do with these guys? And he's like, well, I guess I'll tell them how to fish. Hey, over there. Put the net over there. It's like, oh, <laughs> right? And instantly, disciples and friendships, um, you know what Jesus did for, to be your friend? In some twisted way, he's actually interested in things you're interested in because, as he says, slaves don't know what the master is doing. Friends reveal these things. He shares with you what God is doing. And in some ways, he's sharing with you his interest too. What's his interest? The Father. So much so that he obeyed him to go to the cross, to die for your sins and cleanse that. What kind of a friend lays down their life for their friends? We have at least one. It's the beginning of every other friend we'll make that'll last forever. So let's go to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, that you've given us Jesus Christ. You've given us such a good friend in him. We ask, Lord, that you would make our hearts to first befriend Jesus, to make him the master of our lives, the sole comfort in times of distress. And then, oh, Lord God, that you would people the world around us with other Christians who see the same Jesus and who are also his friend. That God, uh, by your grace, we become something even more. We become the church. We become the family. Lord, we know that these are not always permanent. In fact, sometimes they last one day. Sometimes they last seven. Sometimes they last a month. But God, uh, you know that in the long scheme, these friends last forever because Jesus is resurrected and he lasts forever. God, he is our hope. And uh, Lord, we thank you that we need not be alone, Lord, where your Holy Spirit dwells and grows the people of God. We thank you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.